In 2020, Adobe announced that it would be disabling Adobe Flash Player after the 31st of December that year. To many, this was insignificant. Casual website browsers and Facebook users would rarely encounter websites using Flash in the modern era since most mainstream sites had updated to HTML5. But for another chunk of the population, the death of Adobe Flash Player meant the death of the web as they knew it. Flash Player had been the foundation for hundreds of thousands of games and videos and pieces of media across the web and with Flash Player's death, they were all lost to time. While some games were able to be salvaged by developers or savvy Flash enthusiasts, the event has been likened to a digital burning of the Library of Alexandria and there's no telling how much we've lost. A lot of these Flash games live on only in memory and scraps of information found around the internet and that's where our story begins. Gamevile was a Flash company who, all throughout the 2000s and 2010s, published cheap and bizarre Flash games to their website gamevile.com. Widely played by many but remembered by few, the games had a bizarre, creepy, and liminal feel to them, often feeling haunted or off in some way. Today, let's take a look back at the death of Gamevile in the strange world of creepy and liminal 2000s Flash games. Before we get into things, I just want to give a huge thank you to CapCut for sponsoring this video. You may be asking, Izzy, how are you achieving all of these amazing effects that are occurring on the screen right now? And the answer is CapCut. CapCut is a free all-in-one video editing app for iOS and Android and is perfect for making Instagram, TikTok, and even YouTube videos. CapCut has such a crazy amount of features that I can't cover all of them, but one of their most popular features is the 3D zoom effect that became a viral trend on TikTok. And speaking of TikTok, not only are there tons of super cool and aesthetic filters, but there are really useful effects like removing the background without needing a green screen, text-to-speech and auto captions, stickers, text and font, and more. CapCut has a huge suite of features that will elevate your TikToks and make them super high quality, and that's why so many people use it. But that's not all. If you don't want to shell out hundreds of dollars for Sony Vegas or Premiere, you can use CapCut to make YouTube videos as well. Record yourself or use your own saved videos and photos, edit them together, and add music, sound effects, and voiceovers to create your own YouTube videos. I even made my own Garfield fan cam with CapCut and not to toot my own horn, but I think it turned out pretty good. CapCut has an enormous library of effects, filters, and sounds, and it's completely free so you don't need to make an account and there are no ads or watermarks. So head to the link in the description and download CapCut for free today. Thank you so much to CapCut for sponsoring this video, I really appreciate it, and now let's get on with the story of GameVile. So let's head back to the 2000s where flash games dominated the internet and made up the bulk of browser gaming online. This was the era before mobile gaming and free to play dominated the market so the audience for flash games was huge and flash based sites like Miniclip and Newgrounds quickly rose to popularity. With games like Fancy Pants Adventure, Skull Kid and Stick RPG taking off and gaining millions of plays it was clear that flash games were where it was at. Enter Gamevile in 2003. Gamevile was owned by a Scottish company called Imagey Limited. From their website, quote, Imagia are developers of interactive 2D and 3D gaming, learning and marketing tools either as modular elements for integration into existing systems or as full web or CD packages. Imagia essentially offered game creation services. If you wanted it, they could make it happen from interactive learning solutions like 3D Ancient Wonders and Dinosaur World to architecture and interactive flyovers to viral marketing and brand immersive games. On their games page, one passage reads, quote, Try our 2D and 3D Flash and Shockwave games online now at GameVile.com, an image a developed portal for people to enjoy playing the games we have made. So it appears that after a few years of creating games and projects for clients, GameVile decided to set up their own game portal, as was popular at the time. It was basically a place for image to compile all of the games they'd made and make them more easy to access and play, and they called this portal GameVile.com. GameVile.com had a pretty simple website with a black, red, and yellow color scheme and their very iconic eye logo. Created in 2004, Trigo City was the earliest game listed on their website as well as one of the first 3D shockwave games in the world. Other early games included Small Car, Road Rage, Small Intestine, Flash Cars, Poke the Bunny, Aquanaut, and more. They also had an educational anti-smoking game called Once the Smoke Has Lifted which has my favorite description ever. It didn't stop me from smoking but it reminds us of the facts. At least they're honest. That sort 
of dry humor is pretty common on the site and honestly gave it a lot of charm, take for example their merch page. A lot of other game portals at the time were sort of faceless corporate entities, but GameVile was very distinctly human with spelling errors, a very obvious UK dialect, and a dry wit that ran throughout the whole website. Anyway, GameVile was sort of a hot pot of different games. They had 2D races, card games, Space Invaders clones, story-based 3D experiences, puzzle games, arcade games, platformers, and more. They had games in any and every style and genre, and it appears that they released over 40 games before they even got to Fly Like a Bird. Oh yeah, we should probably talk about Fly Like a Bird. Fly Like a Bird, or a flab I guess, was what introduced me and many, many others to GameVile's website. It became one of their most popular and long-running series, and it makes sense because no one had really done anything like it. Races and puzzles and platformers had been done before, but there weren't many other games where you could take control of an animal in a 3D space and freely fly around with no objectives or hostile enemies. How do I know this? because I was obsessed with flying games. And that's no exaggeration or hyperbole, I was literally obsessed, it, it was a problem. Every night I would look up 3D flying dragon games, MMO where you can fly, MMO RPGs with flight mechanics. I would rent out Spyro Dawn of the Dragon week after week just to spend hours in the free flying valley of Avalar level. I invested money into the how to train your dragon MMO just for the flight mechanics. I downloaded every terrible scammy Unity project that promised flight, I downloaded Astaria just for the dragons until realizing you had to grind and level up before accessing flight, I downloaded World of Warcraft with the sole intent of grinding until I could get a flying mount. I obviously gave up on that pretty quick. I don't know what caused the obsession but that was my thing as a kid and that's how I discovered Fly Like a Bird and by extension Game Vial. The game was released around 2003 to 2005 and despite being released as a rudimentary experiment it was met with unexpected success. From the wiki, quote, According to GameVile, Fly Like a Bird was originally produced as an experiment built for the sake of curiosity. Having recently mastered walking characters and 3D animal models, GameVile sought to go a step further and incorporate the concept of flight into their latest project. The game was extremely basic with PlayStation 1-esque graphics and took place in a low-poly pixelated city level with an extremely rudimentary and blobby dove model. The game allowed you to well, fly like a bird with no objectives, goals, or storylines with the only abilities being flight, chip collection, and pooping on people's heads for points. The game really took off, pun intended, so much so that a sequel was soon released in 2008. GameVile had released their first multiplayer MMO style game, Russia's Army, a year prior and using this newfound knowledge they made a multiplayer version of Fly Like a Bird. The sequel was improved in many ways, the city level was visually nicer and gave players the ability to quote, rise through the smog of the city into a clear blue sky. They also say on the wiki that chips were placed more abundantly throughout the level and I don't know, I just thought that sounded cute. The bird model was upgraded into a pigeon with more detailed and accurate feathers and of course the game now had multiplayer functionality. Players from around the globe could log into the game to fight, play and chat with other birds which skyrocketed the game into viral popularity. And out of this popularity emerged Fly Like a Bird 3, the third and final entry into the series and the one that most people know. Fly Like a Bird 3 built on the foundations of 2, once again improving the basic cityscape and pigeon model but adding a crow and a seagull as well. Nest building and chick raising were added to the game as well as different food types to match the variety of new birds being released. From 2009 to 2014, seven birds were added. Starlings, eagles, robins, barn owls, and parakeets with swans being the last birds added in 2014. More levels were added as well including the hillscape, islands, snowscape, and industry. Unlike the first two games which were used more casually, a dedicated fan base of players began forming around Fly Like a Bird 3 with groups of role players, hackers, and griefers emerging within the community. I feel like a lot of the role players were also weird DeviantArt Warrior Cats kids because a lot of the players would form clans in certain areas of the map like raising families together and fighting other clans in that very distinctly I've read the Warrior Cats books kind of way. Griefers and hackers were a big problem too and not just in Fly Like a Bird but in all of GameVile's multiplayer games. The developers would express frustration at this and spent a lot of time implementing anti-hack features and chasing down offending users to ban them but this largely proved fruitless. Hackers would use external cheat programs to attack or ban other players as well as make their own birds larger, faster, and even immortal. Griefers were extremely common too and would use robins to repeatedly kill other players due to the bird's small size and superior speed. In any server you spawned into, there was a decent chance you'd be immediately swarmed and dive-bombed by a bunch of robins who in reality were just griefers trying to cause havoc in the game. I'm genuinely curious
this though if anyone else out there was a fly like a bird player what was your preferred map and bird i always went for the swan the owl and the macaw and my preferred map was the hillside or the city but that's just because it was the most popular this isn't related to the topic at hand but i'm genuinely curious about like what birds you played as and your experiences in the game i want to find my fly like a bird brethren so anyway bird simulator 9000 was a huge hit and while they did spend a lot of time updating it game vile also continued to focus on pushing out experimental titles as they always had during this time they put out games like x scramble night of the dragon and graying out and we'll get to these later but none of them reached the success that fly like a bird had and game vile were having trouble finding their next big hit that was until lif you are wild and you are free you are a beast of the wild woods Roam the mystical forest and live out your life as a wild animal in their natural setting. Find the totem poles to transform into other animals. Hunt, graze, or forage in the undergrowth for food. Drink from the lakes. You can even swim. Fight and kill or make friends and forge families. Lyf was released in September of 2012. It was an animal simulation game dropping players into a basic forest or heath level and allowing them to switch between rabbits, foxes, wolves, bears, and deer using wooden totem poles scattered throughout the map. Aside from a few basic dens and the totem poles, the maps were vast and barren, populated with foliage, trees, lakes, rivers, and hills. Similar to Fly Like a Bird, there were no objectives, quests, or storylines. The only things that players could do was eat, drink, attack, and mate. Single player was pretty boring with NPC animals overpopulating the map and making it impossible to take a break or stop running without being killed. And that's if all the NPCs weren't completely glitching out. I found the best method of survival was simply climbing up a tree and setting up camp forever. But multiplayer is where Lyft really shined. It took the chaos of the single player game and made it 10 times more fun because instead of 20 NPC bears all swarming you, it was 20 players called poop shit all spawn killing you and telling you to get dunked on. Clans of so called killer bunnies formed, players who would transform into rabbits and team up in large groups to kick wolves and bears to death. Others role played in the dens, raising offspring as families before griefers inevitably swarmed the place. New players stood haplessly as old timers descended upon them as soon as they spawned in while everyone else ran and jumped blindly around the map trying to avoid being attacked. It was honestly peak chaos but it was a damn good time. Unlike other multiplayer games where premium items and status and level and skill mattered, everyone was equally fucked in Lyf and no matter how good you were at the game you would inevitably be ganked by a bunch of wolves who came out of nowhere. The success of Lyf led to a sequel just a year later in 2013, Lyf Serengeti. This added a savannah and an old heath level along with meerkats, lions, wildebeest, crocodiles, and baboons. Lyft would go on to get one more update when the game moved to Steam, adding tundra and desert levels as well as fennec foxes, lizards, horses, ravens, eagles, polar bears, caribou, and ox, but we'll come back to that whole drama later on. Unfortunately, despite the success of Fly Like a Bird and Lyft, it wasn't enough to keep the studio afloat. Before we get into that though, let's take a deep dive into some of GameVile's games and examine exactly why they're so creepy and liminal. In recent years, there's been a lot of talk about so-called liminal spaces. From the Aesthetics wiki quote, The aesthetic known as a liminal space is a location which is a transition between two other locations or states of being. Typically, these are abandoned and oftentimes empty. A mall at 4am or a school hallway during the summer, for example. This makes it feel frozen and slightly unsettling but also familiar to our minds. While liminal spaces are usually depicted as photographs or even videos of real places, liminal spaces exist in video games too and there are plenty of accounts dedicated to posting them. These spaces are often taken from old, outdated games with barren, empty levels, strange designs or art direction and an overall empty, airy vibe. GameVile fits this to a T, with the majority of their games featuring these strange, outdated, abstract worlds and characters. Lyf and Fly Like a Bird are perfectly fun if not chaotic multiplayers, but nowadays all the empty levels feel weird and airy. The vast desert at sunset running through the never-ending forest with only the sounds of birds and rustling foliage to fill the silence soaring over the towering skyscrapers of the grey city. It might sound overdramatic, but it can be pretty damn creepy at times as well as being strangely peaceful and serene. There's a weird beauty in abandoned game vile games, so let's take a look at some other examples. Night of the Dragon was another one of game vile's multiplayer MMO style games which saw moderate success. In it, you start out as a knight and can walk around the small medieval themed map picking up items and fighting other players. There's a cave under the the hill with dragon eggs inside which allow you to turn into a dragon and fly around and torch people. You know, standard stuff. 
Now, I'm assuming this is an issue with the specific port of the game I'm playing because I don't remember the controls being this balked, but the character movement speed is lightning fast to an unplayable degree and the jump is like the height of a skyscraper. The bizarre broken mechanics only add to the weird lonely feeling of the game with low poly ruins dotting the sharp hills and a strangely calm and beautiful ocean surrounding the island. Those ruins are pretty apt because a lot of game vile games feel like ruins, old outdated relics long abandoned by the once bustling community that made them. Ra is a frustrating game. According to the website, it was GameVile's largest game and was essentially an Egyptian god-themed 3D platform exploration game. In the game world, you can find buildings, caves, temples, islands, and plenty of platforming, which is unfortunate because the controls are absolutely abysmal. Like Knight of the Dragon, this used to be an MMO game, but with no one here to play, the game feels empty and dark. Giant Anubis heads rise out of the water, a solitary scorpion sits alone on an island, and the NPC NPCs? Well, the NPCs... Approaching an NPC causes a horrible loud noise to play accompanied by a speech bubble that says meow meow moo. Additionally, my game froze and began blaring a loud static noise when I tried to open this door and approaching this one NPC triggers a looping audio track that doesn't stop no matter how far away you are from him. It appears to be a human voice and it's really hard to tell what it's saying but it sounds to me like Gorgeous Night. Take a listen. A gorgeous Night. A Gorgeous Night. Gorgeous nut. Gorgeous nut. I don't know, let me know what you guys think. When it happened, it genuinely freaked the hell out of me. Super creepy, so yeah, sound off in the comments what you think it is. Rather than feeling empty and odd and liminal like the other games, Ra feels more haunted, more like some sort of deep web creepypasta game. With its strange dark level design, abstract decorations, the constant glitching, and the sudden blaring audio effects. It's a strange game to be sure, but that's how you know it's a game vile game. Egg Scramble is a game where you play as a bunny collecting eggs. Sounds pretty adorable, right? Well, this is game vile, so obviously no. In this bizarre game, you traverse through doorways and through mazes of rooms to collect eggs. Most rooms are engulfed in fire and the eggs aren't easter eggs, but instead eggs painted with beautiful, intricate, and strange paintings. Despite the frustrating controls, I managed to get pretty far in the game and as I progressed, the levels became more red and almost demonic looking, not to mention the sudden and startling alerts that suddenly popped up in random rooms. I find this game very creepy and weird, yes, but I also find it funny that Game Vile's version of a cute bunny egg collection game is this weird, rainy, fiery, abstract egg collection nightmare. It's genuinely something I would expect out of like a Nexpo video, but it's classic Game Vile. I want to mention Graying Out as a final entry because it's the most intentionally scary game on the list. A lot of Game Vile's charm comes from its unintentional weirdness and eeriness, but Graying Out is specifically a horror game and actually reminds me a lot of Silent Hill for the PS1 with its graphics and level design and color scheme. The game is pretty simplistic, tasking the player with wandering through an old house collecting pieces of paper and keys in order to progress all while dodging shadow balls, shadow people, and shadow babies. It's actually quite artsy in parts, with some really cool lighting and effects, and I think it's by far one of GameVile's best looking games. This game is filled with liminal spaces and creepy areas, and the low quality graphics only add to the creep factor and honestly the aesthetic. I could imagine a set of screenshots from this game would fit right in on an account like Horror Games Community or Games with Elite. Jack Auras, shout out to those accounts by the way, they're really cool. The game had some pretty unsettling glitches as well, like when the shadow got me as I was entering a door and the screen faded in on my character T-posing menacingly before the game quit out entirely. But honestly, in my opinion, it's things like that, just little, most likely unintentional bugs and glitches and flaws that make game vile games so spooky and fun. I know that they're bugs, not features, but in a weird way, the glitches really add to the whole haunted aesthetic and honestly enhance the games a lot for me personally. There are plenty of other examples of the strange and creepy worlds of Game Vile. In Equinaut, you pilot a submarine through an endless void. In Lord of Pamera, you traverse a maze and avoid giant eyeballs while a strange pixel face at the side of the screen changes in bizarre ways. In Santa Boarding, you snowboard around a vast, 
empty snow field while avoiding a giant, towering grim reaper who's pursuing you. Baron of Greyhaven is one of their earlier games and the uncanny meter is cranked up to 100 with the graphics. A lot of these games remind me of the kinds of creepypasta games that people release nowadays like Agony of a Dying MMO or honestly any of the games from the haunted PS1 demo disc. But while those games are self-aware and essentially parodies, game file games are so earnest and unintentional in their creepiness and ironically that's what makes them so great. And while the games are no longer bustling and active, they've taken on their own strange liminal beauty in the wake of their abandonment. By the mid-2010s, the popularity of Flash Player was already beginning to decline. The golden age of the 2000s Newgrounds era was long gone, and with the rise of mobile gaming, Flash game portal sites were quickly becoming obsolete. Cracks had been showing for a long time, the popularity of GameVile had steadily been declining throughout the years, and despite releasing some of their most popular games like Lyft, Fly Like a Bird, and Butterfly Game on Android and Steam, it wasn't enough to cover the server costs and keep the lights on. On the 17th of May 2017, GameVile posted a final update on Facebook. Hi folks, we're shutting down now. Thank you so much everybody for playing our games. Did you know that there were 78 million of you from all over the world and you played over 156 million times? We're so proud of that. Things have been rough for a while and the gradual death of web players like Shockwave, Flash and the Unity web player meant that a lot of what we offered was no longer possible on our budget. We tried in many ways to turn the tide, Steam, downloadable Xyz, WebGL and none quite did enough. The final decision was hard even when it seemed inevitable, but now we need to move on. Our multi-user servers will still be up for a good while, Steam and paying Droid users have been prioritised, and www.gamevile.com will remain as long as it can. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed it. That was the biggest thing for us. Game Vile. So why exactly did Game Vile die? Firstly, the decline in popularity of Flash games and the rise of mobile games. Game Vile had been expressing concern over the quote-unquote head honchos in Browserland, making it harder for them to maintain plug-in games for quite a while, and this combined with the decline in popularity meant that money began to get tight. Not only was Flash dying, but mobile gaming was rising to prominence and taking over the market, making game portals like Game Vile obsolete. Multiple times on Facebook, Game Vile had to push back against fans who were upset at their decision to start monetizing their games with the fact that they needed to put food on the table. In their own words, it was quote, steam or starve. And speaking of steam, that's exactly where GameVile had to turn after the traffic to their website dipped so low that game development and even just keeping the servers running was no longer viable. In 2015, they began entering their games into the Steam Greenlight program in order to make some money. The decision to put the fan favorite Lyft onto Steam was especially controversial as fans began to complain that the once free game was now going to be locked behind a paywall. When GameVal posted a brand new Tundra update only available in the Steam version of the game, fans were absolutely outraged despite the fact that they could still play the original for free. We have to pay for new Lyft? Sorry, but nah. That's kinda unfair being a paid game on Steam. GameVile, I hate Steam, please, I want a new Lyft free, please, unimpressed face. And this was another nail in GameVile's coffin, the lack of support from their community. A lot of this can be attributed to the fact that their fanbase was large made up of kids who played game vile games at school instead of doing schoolwork you know, not speaking from experience or anything. But it was also a symptom of the all too common attitudes that players have towards indie game developers. A decent portion of the fanbase seemed to lack any empathy or understanding for game vile with players relentlessly hounding devs for updates, voicing their complaints, and just straight up being rude. When reading game vile's comment sections and their interactions with fans, you get a distinctly hostile, uncaring vibe from a lot of the community. They didn't seem to see the clearly struggling developers as people, but instead a game making machine churning out new games. GameVile obviously had plenty of lovely fans as well, but this constant negative feedback and demanding for a new game had to have worn down morale. And this negative feedback didn't just stop at emails or Facebook comments, it followed them onto Steam when they began to release their games there. From the Lyft Steam reviews, quote, Literally the most broken game I've ever played in my life as a gamer. You can find a slightly stripped down version free online. Unless you value 30 minutes worth of laughs at $9, do not buy this deranged, half-baked animal simulator. I purchased this game as I had casually played it for years in its web-based form and nostalgia moment if you will. I love the idea of Lyft, always have. However, I spent less than an hour playing the new version and went through Steam to get a refund. Bottom line, the game is just not enjoyable anymore. Multiplayer is an utter joke and single player is vastly more annoying than it is fun. I would highly suggest not purchasing Lyft at this time. It's a money grab on a web game that was free to play for many years. Until the game gets a true update and not just more useless content, I would 
advise looking into other naturalist type games. And these criticisms aren't unwarranted, GameViles games just didn't really work on Steam. Not only in a literal sense with frequent bugs, hacks and glitches, but also in the sense that it didn't really fit into the Steam ecosystem. Fly Like a Bird and Lyft and Ra worked perfectly on GameVile.com as weird, fun browser experiences, places to hang out, fly around and explore strange and uncanny worlds. It didn't matter that they looked a bit cheap or had bugs or hackers because the fanbase knew that GameViles games were strange and a bit broken, but that's what made them so cool and esoteric. Now put Steam's weird, cool, esoteric niche gaming experiences into the context of a paid platform and suddenly these flaws are framed very differently. According to reviews, people were paying somewhere between $9 to $20 for the games and players simply didn't feel like they were worth that much. I, more than anyone, wish that GameViles games had succeeded in earning the money and being successful on Steam, but as much as I love Lyft, I understand why it didn't sell. In its original form, Lyft was this crazy wildlife simulator where you'd run around and fight people and have babies and basically go stupid, go crazy, and it was also this weirdly airy world, empty and calm and reflective and haunting. On Steam, it was a nonsensical flash game with no story, clunky mechanics, and not much to do but run around the small, half-finished map which was often buggy and glitched. Fans of the original were let down by the lack of substantial updates and improvements from the free version, and randoms who stumbled upon the game's Steam page thought they would be getting a shelter-esque animal survival game and were utterly bewildered at what they got. This sounds cheesy and like hipstery, but I genuinely do think that some things are too unique and special and weird to thrive on popular platforms. I completely understand why people were upset with what they got, I mean the games were very broken and bare bones, but I also feel like there was a certain eerie, liminal, buggy magic to game vibe that only the original fans could really appreciate. The death of Flash was a huge blow to a lot of online communities, but especially Flash game sites. In a previous video about Girls Go Games, we discussed how the death of Flash effectively killed the site, with all but the most popular games being unplayable and abandoned. This has happened hundreds of times over on other 2000s game portals, and most Flash web websites these days are messy, broken, and no longer being maintained by their owners. And that's best case scenario, other sites have been completely shut down and lost with no trace of their games to be found anywhere. This was very nearly the fate of GameVile, with their website completely gone and all of their games lost in the Flash Purge, that is, if it wasn't for Raven Woods. GameVile donated their games as open source to a small group of game developers called Raven Woods in early 2018. The group has done a fantastic job at preserving these games with Lyft, Fly Like a Bird, Night of the Dragon Ra, and more available to play on their Itch.io, and many more games available on their website to download as .exes and zips. Aramapatol, Graying Out, Carnival of Pies, and more are all available, and like I said, the group has done us all a great service by saving these games and allowing us to freely download and play them. So many games have been lost in the Flash Purge, so it's really awesome that so many people cared enough about this weird, cool company and their weird, cool games to go out of their way to salvage them. I know this might be an obscure topic that no one cares about, but I'm glad that I was able to show you all my favourite old Flash game site and show you through the weird and wonderful worlds of GameVile. Talking about weird, vaguely creepy 2000s web things is like my favourite thing ever, and I really enjoy talking about it, so I hope that you guys enjoy listening to it. If you guys have any experiences with GameVile games, um, whether you used to play them as a kid or you used to use the site back when it was active or even if you just have like a similar 2000s flash game site that you used to always use um definitely let me know i'm genuinely really interested i want to know if this is like actually an obscure thing or if other people played game vile games as much as i did as a kid so definitely let me know your experiences down in the comments thank you so much for watching i really appreciate it if you ever have any other suggestions definitely let me know down in the comments for videos you want me to make in the future or topics you want me to cover um thank you so much to CapCut for sponsoring this video they're awesome definitely go check them out and yeah thank you guys so much for watching i really hope you enjoyed it and i hope to see you in the next one bye Thank you so much to my Garfield Overlords over on Patreon. Redmaf, Joe Bradshaw, Brianna Robinson, Agarafin, Arcantilus, Astrium Vortex, Dozo Blint, Helm Hamburger Hand, Jesse Chisholm, Kimono My Gyro, Sheriff Whiskey, Sophie Skidder, The Furby Librarian, Tyson, Ren Pendragon, Finley, Grip Gunderson, John Leach, Pom, Xavier Araujo, Charlie B, Simon, Jordan Nielsen, Dana Homegardner, Boysenberry Switchblade, SHSL Sunsun, Chicory, Doug, Trebizonde, Samsung Account, and Anne Ginkgo Fox. Thank you guys so much for supporting me. If you want to join these guys over on Patreon, the link will be in the description. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye!